So, Jacob, can you tell us about space? Space. I suppose I could tell you something about space, but I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be telling you. Let's start with where it's difficult. And that's where Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, as you know, comes around and says, you cannot know about the outside world. Because the outside world can only be reached through your senses. And your senses, as it were, interpret the behaviour of things through their own codes. So we code light waves with colours. The colours do not exist outside there, they exist in our mind. We don't, the sounds that we hear do not exist outside of us, but they are vibrations in the air that we code with sounds that we only hear in our minds. That's something really rather weird because it means actually that we hear lots of noise, but outside of us there is a deathly silence, and yet we can hear each other speak. That takes a little while to sort of get used to and think about. So when we talk about space, what we're really talking about is information that comes to us in the form of the behaviour of things and that we then give a certain value in the form of a colour or a sound or even a texture. Now, if you think about that, then suddenly you realise that when you talk about space, you talk about the behaviour of things around you and your relationship to those things, but you're not completely sure what it is you're talking about. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and that makes it really rather weird. However, if we're happy with that, we can say, OK, so space is information. We're not completely sure of the nature of that information, but hey, we don't need to worry too much about it because we have developed codes whereby we can learn about and interpret and use that information to make sure that we don't fall off stairs, to fall off cliffs, or fall into the water, or do all sorts of awful things that would make our life a little bit more uncomfortable. So space is primarily information. And we've learned to cope with that information through codes. What I then find so interesting is the move that uh, um, an environmental psychologist made, J.J. Um, Gibson, in a wonderful book called, um, what was it called? It was called The Visual Perception of Space, or something like that. Um, we need to look up the proper title. And he was somebody who was particularly interested in, in the psychology of vision, and he gave a really rather beautiful description of what space is. He said, walk through a space. Could you please do that with the camera? Could you just sort of walk around me, maybe? Now, while the camera is walking around me, look at how things move relative to the edges that do not move, right? And that's the information that makes up your visual space. You see surfaces moving relative to other surfaces. Some move quickly, some move slowly, some don't move at all. That is how the information of space comes to you. We call it the parallax effect. And that is what really gives us the visual experience of space. Now, 
Of course, vision is our most important space interpreting machine. But it would be really, really impoverishing if we only looked at visual space. What is far more exciting is if we then start looking at herd spaces and that we perform the same kind of analysis on herd spaces as we did with visual spaces where the parallax and the movement of edges and surfaces relative to one another um, works. Well, Gustav Mahler, the great Viennese composer, he actually used a similar effect in sound. He wanted his symphonies to give far away sounds as well as very close by sounds. So he used the spatiality of sound, and there have been more composers who've done similar things. He uses the spatiality of sounds to orchestrate and compose his symphonies. So there's also something we can call audible space. And the same goes for senses that are even closer to the body, like the sense of smell, which also has a kind of spatiality, and even taste and touch have very uh, subtle and nuanced spatial workings. Now, as with everything, once you start adding these up, you get much more than the sum of the parts. So the most exciting kind of space is, I think, where all these various sorts of information come together and start working together so that as you walk and move through a space, the visual, the audible, the um, olfactory, the, um, the taste bud stuff, the tactile, they all start working together to create one kind of symphonic sense one symphonic experience of space. And I think, I think that's really exciting. But now we need to tie it back to architecture. And that's where I think this particular way of looking at space becomes in really rather useful. Because a lot of nonsense is spoken about space. And personally, you know, being of a slightly analytical frame of mind, I can't bear the mysterious and the mystique nonsense that's often talk and talked about when, they, when people use the word space and then start looking all ethereal. For me, space is information, and that information can create truly poetic experiences, wonderfully poetic experiences. So what does an architect do to create those experiences? And that's where we need to rethink what the job of an architect is, I think. I think the job of an architect must be, surely, sort of similar to the job of a film director, in that the architect must have evidence-based knowledge of how space may be experienced by people under certain conditions, and has knowledge of how to direct that knowledge of space to create volumes and masses and sequences that thereby um, allow people using a space to create um, a wonderfully memorable moment for themselves, just as I have every day as I walk to this wonderful building where we teach architecture here at the DUA in Anvil. I think that's space, sort of, a bit. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, won't surprise you with me. I need some time to process everything you told me, um, but I will. Um, so, thanks again. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I usually take. But are you-